and to you all, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat. May Allah, inshaAllah, give us tawfiq and opportunity, inshaAllah, in this month, the month of Ahlul Bayt, inshaAllah, to learn and to achieve the most out of this time, inshaAllah, and be able to apply these teachings and lessons from Ahlul Bayt into our lives, inshaAllah. Alhamdulillah, once again we have tawfiq uh, to participate in the majalis in Muharram. When I was just coming here today, I remember that the beginning of Muharram, the amazing passion and soul that we see among the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Probably wherever you go right now, definitely at this time around the United States, you know, all the states, the majalis of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, all the masajid, all the centers, all together. The same purpose, the same path, that alhamdulillah, they are having the majalis for Imam Hussein. I don't think we can find anything else like this, the name of Ahlul Bayt in the path of Allah that can unite people like this towards one direction, alhamdulillah, that everyone with this passion that it's the passion, the love, the heat from the love of Muhammad Hussain Ali Salatu Wasalam based on that hadith that is driving all of us, alhamdulillah, to be active in this path. And we ask Allah, inshaAllah, give us tawfiq to make us more active and bless us. And inshaAllah, make this participation zakhira and reward for dunya wal akhirah with the Lord Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ashura has two different pages. From one side is a very sad event with all the tragedies that we know happened in Ashura that made Ashura the biggest musibah and tragedy in the whole universe. The biggest musibah and tragedy that you can find from the beginning to the end of the world, based on Ziyarat Ashura, as we recite, is the musibah of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam. This is one side of it. And the second side is the side of the loyalty and bravery and iman and power and a strength in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, people usually 
talk about the first page. And they only emphasize on the first page that what happened in Karbala, what happened the day of Ashura, how they, you know, martyred Imam Hussein and his family and his companion. They just emphasize on the first part, which is very important, by the way. And some people are neglected about the most important, the second part, the lessons and the teachings from Ashura and from Muharram. What we have to gain, we have to combine these two pages together, inshallah, to be able to reach and get the, that soul of Muharram, the soul of Ashura, inshallah, in order to be able to say that we're walking and we're active in front of, in, in the path of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wa salam, and in Muharram. If we are missing one of this side, it's like two wings that you have to have both together, learn from the teachings of Karbala and Imam Hussain, what happened over there, and second, of course, to memorize and to actually, you know, to learn and to uh, commemorate the Masa'ib of Ahlul Bayt and Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam. Before I go for further and go to the details, inshallah, I would like to ask a question. I want to ask myself and you ask yourself as well. What did you learn and get from previous Muharram and Majalis that we participated. If you look back right now and see that, let's say last year, the year before, what did you achieve from the Majalis of Imam Hussain? Do you remember anything? Do you think the Majlis of Imam Hussain, this power behind the Majlis of Imam Hussain, could change even part of your life? Did it affect you somehow positively to move forward and to change some part of your life? That's a big question. Because the whole reason of Muharram, the whole reason that Islam, you see that right now, is alive because of this passion that we see in the maktab, in the path of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam. So what is it for me? Am I supposed to just come to the majlis of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam and just have the masaib and cry for Imam Hussain and leave? which is very important, which is very amazing. I'm going to talk more about this, which we should do. But is this the only reason that Imam Hussein became martyred and shaheed for me just come and cry for him? So then outside my life is still is totally different than the life is of Imam Hussein. Is the purpose of the shahadat of the best of all people at the top of Imam Hussein himself and his family is that group of people come and cry for Imam Hussein only and when it comes to their business, when it comes to their family, when it comes to interaction with others, when it comes to halal and haram, everything else is against Imam Hussain. I'm going to ask you, is this the purpose? If that's the purpose, then the first people who cried for Imam Hussain were those people who killed Imam Hussain, some of them. But they didn't get why. What happened? The message of Karbala, the message of Muharram, the message of Imam Hussain, why Imam Hussain is coming there, as a representative of Allah, as Imam. So what is the message over there? So I'm going to ask this question. What did we get from previous Muharram? I purposely pause a little bit so we can think as well. And that's about past Muharrams, the previous Muharrams that we had. And I'm going to ask the same question for this Muharram. Now what is your goal for this Muharram? Now what you want to achieve from this Muharram? Do you have any plan? Because Muharram is so strong, it's so powerful, that can change people. Not within two, three, four, five, ten days. Within few seconds and moments. We have the proof. You know that proof. Horribni Yazid Riyahi, right? But in few moments, few minutes, he realized what he's doing. And from going directly to, to you know, the hellfire, he's going right away to what? To heaven. Because of the power of Muharram. Because of this, look at it as a university that has a lot of graduates with the highest level of, you know, degrees and grades that you can imagine. About Fadl Abbas, alayhi salatu wasalam, himself. Zainab, salamu alayhi these are the graduates from the school of Imam Hussain, right? Now this Muharram has this much power. 
And now that I know that Alhamdulillah I have the tawfiq to be registered in this, in this class, in this academic environment that we can find it to learn, what is my purpose? Now I'm sitting here for what? If they give a paper and a pen right now, from right side all the way, go all the way, come here, write down what do you want to have from this Muhammad? What part of your life you want to change to get closer to the life of Muhammad? How many of you guys, you already thought about this? How many of you, you know exactly what you want to do? Otherwise, it's a purposeless, you know, movement. However, just coming to the majlis of Imam Hussain, it's blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Entering the majlis, breathing in the majlis of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wa salam, is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Entering the majlis of Imam Hussain, it's as entering heaven. Look at this, I'm just putting this together, very important. The hadith is saying, the carpet of the majlis of Imam Hussain is the wings of malaik, the angels. That side, just being in the majlis of Imam Hussain and breathing, you need to, you have to have tawfiq. But okay, alhamdulillah that we have tawfiq. Alhamdulillah that Allah gave us this opportunity. So what else? How can I do to maximize this opportunity and power so I learn and get as much as possible from this? So that was to the parentheses and the parentheses that we have to think about this, what we want to learn from this. And we have to have a purpose, all of us. Let me tell you what. What I might, Muharram has different, you know, messages. One general message that we can find for everyone to learn, the bravery, stand up for justice and rising, and all the things. And some personal messages for every single of us. What I might need from this Muharram might be different than yours. You have to look at yourself to customize this Muharram for what you need in this Muharram. What you need to get from this Muharram. Matter of fact, if you don't pay attention to this personal aspect, that what am I supposed to change? What, what do you mean say it? I mean what part of my life is not similar to the recommendations of Imam Hussain What part of my life is away and further away from the life of Imam Hussain? My business? My family? My child rearing, my interactions with others, my salat, my fasting. What part of it that is not close to the life of Imam Hussain that I have to my temper, my marriage? What part of it is that I have to change that I see? You know what? How many years I know that Alhamdulillah I'm a follower of Imam Hussain and how long do I see that I'm changing my ibadah? Do I see the quality of my ibadah is changing? Imam Ali says two of your days should not be equal. Do I see that? My salat compared to last Muharram, I'm saying two different, you know, whole year. My salat compared to last year is a different salat, has a better quality. But some people come to me and say, you know what? Before I get married, I got married, I was more religious. Now that I'm married, I'm less religious. But I'm like, you're supposed to be more religious. You're supposed to improve. You're supposed to go to the next grade when you know, when you go to school, remember? You're supposed to go to the next grade, not to go backward. So these two pages that we mentioned, that we have to pay attention, both teachings of Ashura and the connection, emotional and spiritual connection with Imam Hussain wasalam, made it so amazing, the whole story of Muharram and Ashura, that actually they're very, they're actually some hidden, strange event and aspects in Muharram that we have to analyze. Ashura happened 50 years, only 50 years after the demise of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By who? By those people that some of them are the companion of Rasulullah. By those that they claim that they are the lovers of Ahlul Bayt in Kufa, right? Under the allegiance of those people that they call themselves the Caliph of Rasulullah. Killing who? The grandson of Rasulullah, that Hussein al Minni wa Ana Min. Hussein, everyone narrated this. It's a strange. How is, it, how is it possible that those people who are the Caliph of Rasulullah, up until the last three years of the life of Rasulullah, they tried to kill Rasulullah and they were fighting with him? Hmm? Abu Sufyan? 
For 20 years, he fought with Rasulullah and he wanted to kill Rasulullah. And we see that within the last three years, they had to convert to Islam unwillingly because they're losing everything. <coughs> and we see that 30 years after that, Muawiyah become what? The Caliph of Rasulullah. And 20 years after that, they're killing Imam Hussein alayhi salatu What happened to that society? Two questions. Who are these people? Who are this Bani Umayyah? Who are this, this tribe? That those of Rasulullah himself, you know, he rejected them. They got their power. And the second question that we would like to answer throughout all these days and nights, how come those people who claim to are the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, the followers of Ahlul Bayt actually, they prayed as Muslim. They buried their deceased one as Muslim. They fasted as Muslims. They did. They go to Hajj as Muslims. How is it possible that these people stand in front of Muhammad Hussein and they kill him? Don't you think it's a strange? Something is going on here. Something doesn't add up here. How is it possible the enemies get the power and those they, they know who Imam Hussein is sending 12,000 letters to Imam Hussein that they're asking him to come back. They stand in front of Imam Hussein and they kill him. Let me explain one thing. We're not going to talk about just, you know, narrate some pieces of history that you say, oh my God, another you know, lecture about the history. No. Matter of fact, we have to look back to see what happens for the sake of our current time. Because it looks like we're so similar. It looks like the history proof that it's going to repeat again and again. We do this every day. When you want to apply to a university, you know what you do? You go back, look at the rate of the university, look at those who graduated from that university, look at past people before you. They were there, they studied there, and based on their success or failure, you decide to what? To go there or not. When you want to choose a good physician, doctor for yourself, what do you do? You tell me. You go read the rates, right? You go read the comments of those people who use that person or that business to see what were their experience. Was it a failure or success? Based on that, you decide what you want to do today. Am I right or not? So we have to look back at the history to see what happened. What was the big virus in that society? The society of apparently the followers of Ahlul Bayt, quote unquote, which we shouldn't even say that, those who claimed that they love Muhammad Hussein and they were Imam Hussein. Hussein, come that we're waiting for you. And they were sending letters to Imam Hussein. What happened to that society? That when Imam Hussein get closer to them, they stand in front of him and kill him with that that way that we all know what happened, the most tragic way that you can not even imagine. What happened to them? Because of what? Because we are similar. How? Because, very interesting, they were waiting for the Imam of their time, Ahlul Kufa, the people, right? They were waiting for Imam of time, and we are waiting for our Imam of time as well, don't we? Yeah. They sent letter to Imam Hussein, 12,000 letters. That each letter they said, multiple people have, you know, they signed the letter. That means way more than 12,000, you know, people claimed and sent letter. And they invited Imam to come. We need you, Imam. Don't we do that every day? Allahumma ajjal waliyak al-faraj. Please, Imam of us, come back. We need you. Ya Allah, Imam of us, right? It's like the letters that we're sending, Imam, come back, please. We need you. Please return. Isn't it that they were among the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu was salam, Ahlul Kufa, you know that? They experienced Imam, ha Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam, Imam Hassan, they know who are these people. They send letter to Imam Hussein, Hussein, come and you be our leader, we need you. You be our Imam. And apparently we're at the current time that, Alhamdulillah, we are among the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu was salam. But well, there's a big difference here, that we do not want that history to be repeated again. We do not, inshallah, we will not let that happen again, that Imam of the time get closer to the Ummah and people be against. You know what Shia got hurt mostly from? From not analyzing what happened before and repeating the same mistake over and over and over. They didn't sit down at the time of, you know, imagine Imam Hassan alayhi salatu was salam, sit down, group, I'm talking about the khawas of Shia, I'm talking about those who love Ahlul Bayt like you guys, I'm not talking about those who claim. 
They didn't sit down together to analyze the situation that says, what happened? Why this happened? Why did he betray Amir al-Mu'mineen? That's why the story of Imam Hassan happens. Right after they betrayed his own commanders, they betrayed Imam Hassan Hassan, right? And then right after Imam Hassan, they didn't sit down to analyze that what we want to do. To analyze what happened to the Ummah, what happened to that society, what virus went to that society. That what happened, that they betrayed Imam Hassan, the story of Karbala happens. And go on and on and on. Because they didn't, they didn't know what they were getting hurt from. What is? What is the reason, the factor that is hurting them, that made those people? I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that those people who killed Imam Hussein, والسلام, they were born to be among the killers of Imam Hussein? No. We have some big names among them. Omar al Sa'd, the commander of the army of Yazid, one day he came to Imam Hussein way before Muhammad Ashur. Hussein, look what people are saying. They said, I am among those people who, were, who will kill you. He's upset. Why are they saying this? When Ibn Ziyad tell him that you should take the, you know, the lead and be the commander, Umar al-Sad is saying, I have to think about it. If you're so sure, why well, you have to think about it? And he said, yeah, I know that. If I fight with Hussein, I'll definitely destroy my Akhirah and the other world. But if I fight with Hussein, I'm going to have this dunya. That's what I'm going to have this dunya. They knew who is Imam Hassan And it's a process. I'm building this introduction, inshallah, to go to the topic. They knew about this thing. Something happened in the process of their daily life. Every day life. Some factors went into their lifestyle and destroyed them. That's why they stood in front of Imam Hassan And they killed Imam Hussain and his family. And now I'm going to ask you a question. If we don't analyze those factors, would that possible that those factors would be among our societies and communities and families? So what that means, that means we are, remember this phrase that I want to say, we need a lot, we will talk a lot about this. We are the bridge between Ashura and Duhur, in, this, in the middle. waiting for our Imam. We're preparing ourselves, inshallah. Our Masajid is by the name of Imam of Asma Mahdi alayhi salatu wassalam. Salawad ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So we have to know about this. We have to understand what happens. Let me give you some examples. Let me actually answer the first question. What was wrong with Bani Umayyah that they were against Islam and the true teachings of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wassalam? What are the main factors that actually hurt them and they were against Imam Hussain Ali Salaam? Number one, some of the factors. Remember, what do we want to do? We're going to take a look back from that society. We're going to look at that society over there. What happened, find the factors and the viruses, bring them back here to see that, okay, it's a template. To see, do we have any of them here or we don't have it? Number one, discrimination and racism that they had, but you mean, what that means, that we are the best race in Arab, we are better than others, we have money, we are Arab, our nation, our race, we are better than others, Ajem, non-Arabs are no one, nothing, they shouldn't even be part of anything here, they, they saw themselves better than others, what Islam is saying, I want to ask you, Quran is saying what, Quran is saying, inna akramakum, in dallahi, at Qaqam, if you want to see who is better than others, it's not because of the color, or because of the language, or because of the generation, nope. The closer of you guys to Allah is the better, uh, best of you guys. To the highest level of discrimination they had, that they were all better than others. This is one of the main things that they were going against Islam. Let's come to our societies. Is there anyone can stand up and says we don't have discrimination in our societies? No, we don't have it. We know that some societies are actually, some families are, are having issue with this as well. That when I, someone is asking for my daughter, what is the first thing I look at? Maybe it's those people that you know outside. Here, alhamdulillah, we're good. Outsiders, they look at what? 
bank account, financial stability. They look at the color, they look at the language, they look at the race, the nation. Someone came to me, one of the youths that said, a sister says, someone is asking for me. Two people are asking for me. One of them is practicing, but it's not with the same nation and, and you know, race, nationality as my father. And someone who is not practicing, <laughs> but he's the same, you know. My father said, no, that person that is from the same language. What is it? Is it discrimination? I have all the clients come to me, specifically youth, talking about this and different issues related to that topic that, you know, either the financial aspects, money-wise, or... I think we have to go a little bit further. We have to go talk about some details here so we know what's going on. If someone, if I'm coming to the center, for example, when I look around, I want to sit next to someone. Do I look for that person who has higher, you know, social statuses than others? To sit next to him because, you know, he's, mashallah, he has a lot of money or... Or will I sit next to that person that probably others they don't respect him that much or her? Something that we have to see that... Here's the thing. If you tell someone that... Very simple example. If you tell someone that you are like Shimr, Nauzubillah. <laughs> that person says, Astaghfirullah, you're insulting me. You shouldn't say that. But if I tell him, you know, you're jealous, and Shimr had the jealousy as well. One of the main characteristics of Shimr that actually lead to the Shahad of Muhammad Hussein was jealousy. So what do you mean you're not like Shimr? One of the most characteristics of Shaitan actually is what is jealousy. So what we want to analyze is the characteristics of those people to get away from those characteristics. Because the reason that the best of people in the Muslim societies, the highest, the most respected one, became the dhalil and became, you know, humiliated one. You see that after all, sure what happened to them. And we see some people like the slave of Imam Hussein, Qam, you know, Qulam of Imam Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam. The slave of Imam Hussein becomes among those people that no one respected him at that time. But me and you, when you recite the ziyarah, it says, Ya laytana kunna ma'akum fa We wish we were like you, the slave of Imam Hussein. What happened that those who were in that lower status came up, and those who were up like Umar al-Sa'd, they became very humiliated. Yeah. One of we have to analyze these characteristics. One of them was this. This discrimination that we see a lot among the societies is still. The second factor that I would like to talk about this. The lifestyle of people at that time. The lifestyle of Bani Umayyah and the lifestyle of people of Kufa deprived them from assisting the Imam of their time. What do you mean? They mean he came to Imam Hussein. The Imam is coming, getting close to Karbala. All right? And he is seeing one of people of Kufa and telling him and inviting him to come and help him. Look at this. Imam of time, Imam of Asr, Imam Hussein is calling someone and is asking him to come and help us. You know what he says? No, Imam Hussein, I really wish that I could help you, but my family and I have my cows and camels and sheep. Someone should take care of them. You know what it is? being attached to this dunya. The lifestyle that they created and they built for themselves is depriving them from moving forward. We have the hadith that those people that are so attached to this dunya and everything for them is just making their $2, $4, $4, $8 and go on and on. Those people at the end of their life, Billah, when they, when Israel comes as goodbye, you have to go. It's so difficult for them to say bye. Why? Because all the money and the asset comes in front of their eyes and doesn't let them leave this dunya because they're so attached to something. They're so attached to dunya. We have to bring proofs. Omar al-Sa'd is a perfect example. The commander of the army. Look what happened. He said, I know killing Imam. He said he knows Imam Hussein. He knows Imam Hussein is the son of Amir al Mu'mineen, the son of Zahra, the grandson of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He knows this. But 
when it's between deciding between dunya and akhara, which one he decides? Dunya. Being attached to this dunya. He said, you want to be the governor of Ray? Because he told him, if you kill Imam Hussein, could you kill Hussein? So you, I'll give you this power, so you'll be the governor. So he, against his beliefs, because his beliefs is weak beliefs, he's going and standing in front of Imam Hussein and he's killing Imam Hussein for the sake of dunya. Remember this, the life is not. We're gonna come back to our time right now. Come here and analyze our societies. And I will analyze our family. And we're talking about them, mashallah, the followers of Ahlul Bayt. We're not talking about the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. We said we have to see what happened at that society the society who invited the Imam of the time and they stood in front of him and killed him. To find what happened over there, to see if we have any of the things in common and shared with them. And let's come today. How many of people claim, quote unquote, that follows Ahlul Bayt, their life is so. Their, I don't know, their houses, the way, the whole life of them is just their business. I see him and says, brother, you know, you have to spend more time with your, his wife comes to me and says, brother, you have to spend more time with your family, you know that. You're spending above 50 something hours per, per week working. How many hours, how many times, how many hours you see your children? He says, two, one, two hours per week. I'm like, but you're responsible for them, you know that. I know that you might make three, four thousand dollars more per month. But you know that you're destroying your generation here. They need a father to train them. Don't rely on Sunday school or somebody, somebody else. Or some, they need a father to supervise them, to teach them. Isn't it being attached to Dunya? Don't you think that at the day of judgment, they stop you and they said, okay, so you destroy this generation. If someone, one of them from this generation, one of your children, na'uzubillah, go against the path of Allah and Ahlul Bayt and doesn't practice, they might stop me. What did you do here? I provided a lot for them. I made a lot of money and provided a big, big house and everything. Yeah, but what happened to the Iman? What happened to the call? Who taught them about the Islam? Who taught them about the love, love of Muhammad Hassan? Yeah, because it was, it was the Muharram and while it was still working at night when he was the Majesty of the Muhammad. But said, who's going to pay? The bills. But I know all these things. But there are certain things you cannot take it back. Being attached to dunya. Muhammad is started telling him and he says, you know, between the ray and killing the Muhammad Hussain, I said, salam, I pick dunya. And let me tell you what, it's a process. It's a process. Someone cannot say, do you think those people who stood with Imam Hussein, who helped Imam Hussein, the <coughs> companion of Imam Hussein, do you think there are those people that all of a sudden they feel like so emotional and they were against everything, their life so much, everything changed, and all of, all of a sudden they came and said, yes, let's go help Imam Hussein. No. The history, look at their history. They did something that they had the tawfiq to become among the shuhada of Karbala. That today, million and million people, when they go to Ziyarat from Hussein, they go to the Ziyarat of the Shuhada of Karbala as well. It's not randomly that some people got emotional. On the other side, it's not randomly that some big, big name in Kufa among the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they failed and they didn't help Imam In Kufa, we have different groups of people. I'm going to say that, so come back to this life as well, the society, see if we have or not. Group number one are those people who are the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. They didn't help Imam Hussein. No, we're against them. Group number two, they wanted to help Imam Hussein. They were so passionate to help Imam Hussein, like Salat was Salam, upon the, the time we were threatened by Ibn Ziyad. So they left Imam Hussein. <laughs> so I am with my Imam until my life is not in danger, until my money is not in danger. Don't we have some people here today? This, this, you know, in the whole world right now? As soon as there is a conflict between what? Between dunya and akhirah, they pick dunya. As soon as something happened about Islamophobia, say, can I just not have a hijab because it looks like this? Can I have just not? What do you mean? The first people, the first time that Islamophobia happened, it was at the time of the beginning of Islam and Rasulullah, he introduced Islam to people. Abu Lahab and Abu Sufyan, they, they started, you know, Islamophobia, it's not about today. 
So if Muslim from the beginning could say, Rasulullah, can we please, we are scared, you know, something happened in the society. Can we just not practicing? Can we just not saying our prayers? Can we just not having a job? Then we wouldn't have Islam today. Some people think it just happened recently, Islamophobia. No! Some people stay with Islam until it doesn't hurt the money, their peace. So the Muslims of sunny, beautiful day, and everything is fine. The bank account is beautiful. The car is parked over there. The house is nice. Everybody is happy. I'm Muslim too. As soon as it gets a little bit cloudy, which one? I have to leave? Of course, Islam. Some people. People of Kufa, remember? Second, they wrote letter to Imam Hussain alayhi salatu Hussain, come, come, we need you, we need you. In the letter says, our gardens are beautifully made and green and we are waiting for you to come. The fruits are ripe and ready. And when the Imam comes, with a little bit of the threat comes from Ibn Ziyad, they stay in front of Imam Hussain. So those people who attach so much to this dunya. Say, is it your analogy? Is it your understanding? Is it your word? No, you know that those who know me from previous time, they know that whatever I say, I try, inshallah, to make it actually authentic by even ayat of Quran or tradition or something. Imam Hussein himself, he said in Karbala. We're talking about what? The second characteristics of people at that time. Bani Umayyah specifically. Imam Hussain himself, he's teaching, he's talking to army of Yazid, the day of Ashur. He's talking to the army of Yazid, right? Look at this, it's so, it's so sad and it's so amazing example for us. Who is talking? Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam. The best speaker in the whole world. Because not only the content is the best content Imam is using, the Imam of time. The spirituality of the just the way that Imam talks, he's the representative of Allah. The way he talks, he penetrates to the heart and affect people and change people. Look at like us. We wish that we go next to the Marja, next to go to, to the Arif, to the Mist. Someone who's so close to Allah, sit and advise us so because of the soul of that person will change, right? Forget about the content. Imam Hussein is talking to them. That the words of Imam can change the mountains, remove the mountains. He's talking to them and he's telling them about the truth and all the things. Imam is teaching them. They're not listening. They started making noise. Imam came back. What happened? The heart, their stomachs are full of haram. And then Imam on the other side says, People are the slaves. These people over there, he was talking to these people. These people are the slaves of dunya. The last, the highest, actually, sickness that you can find for a heart is what Imam says. Being the slave of dunya. Because me and you, we like dunya, right? We're working, and that's good. That's good. Muslim, we work, we provide for our family, we want more, we work for more, we want for promotion, right? This is not bad. In the hadith, in the ziyarah, in the dua, in the Imam Sajjad, it says, Allahumma awsi' fi rizqi, Ya Allah, I want more rizq, more money. This is fine, this is good. Up until the time that is conflicting with what? With the akhirah, right? But that, the sad, the, 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 you know, the disease is here where the Imam says, they not, they don't like it. They are the slave of dunya. They serve dunya, this we will say. That's why they kill Imam Hussain. That's why he had the, look at this. He had the head of Habib, the one who killed him. He's coming to Kufa, at the gate of Kufa. He saw that a young person is standing and he's, he's looking at the head and he's sad. He says, can I help you or something? He says, yeah, you have the head of my father in your head, after Ashura. So the guy was a little bit touched. He said, oh, I'm sorry about this. He said, at least, the son said, at least give me the head so I can bury. He says, yeah, I really wish I could help you, but if I take it to the palace, they're going to give me more coins. What happened here? Yeah. We 
finding one of the viruses and sicknesses of that society. And by the way, the old people of Kufa, they're not, you know, cowards. You know, Kufa, the city of Kufa was built at the time of the second caliph. Why? Because they wanted an army city close to a place like Iran at that time and Persia at that time, so they invaded. So they wanted something close by only the soldiers. You know, people of Kufa were so brave. Majority of them are soldiers. To have that city over there. The same brave people and knights, what happened? Ibn Ziyad comes and sits on the member. The first khutbah in the sermon, it says, you see that I see some heads ripe like, uh, like a ripe you know, fruit ready to be picked. That means I'm going to you know, kill you guys. As soon as this group of them, the same soldiers, the God is scared. Oh, okay, so, you know, and he didn't start at the beginning to say, okay, let's go kill him. No, the first thing Shaitan comes, the first thing he asks them is that just stop. The bayah and religious and they're like, yeah, it's not a bad thing, so we're not going to kill Hussein. We just, you know, we just break our allegiance with him. Huh? So we're not going to help Muslim Ibn Aqil anymore, right? Just one thing. Muslim is not Hussein, so that's why we're against Muslim. You know how to justify it. The second, Ibn Ziyad comes and says, you shouldn't go to the army of Muhammad Hussein. They're like, yeah, we're not going to kill, probably, you know, we're not going to kill Hussein. Let's not just go there, you know. Step by step. You know how Shaitan comes and, you know, deceive people. So this is what happened with these people, dunya. We're going to talk a lot about this. Like I said, dunya is not bad. In the salat that we recited together, we said together, what did we say in Qurut? Rabbana. If you, you memorize it, I think so, right? Let's recite together. Rabbana, atina, hasana, fi dunya hasana. I want in dunya hasana, I got this in this dunya as well. So if it's this dunya is so bad, what are you want? You know, hasana will do something. Amir al Mu'minin, he showed who is Amir al Mu'minin in this dunya, right? For us. The companion, the soldier of Muhammad Hussein, reached that level through this dunya. So we can use this dunya for the goodness. It's that moment that I see between dunya and akhirah. When it comes between my salat and my business, between my salat and my education, between my deen or my society. That's a problem. People of Kufa, they decided to go with what? Their dunya. Leave their deen. As I said, Umar Islam says, I know standing in front of the same time is destroying my akhirah. But there's a lot of money here. By the way, mom says to him, you will never eat from the bread of Ray. Believe me. Imam told him, told him, Umar Islam, you're not going to get there. You're not going to have that promise that they gave you. When you become blind by dunya, before, before Muhammad, before Ashura, the day before I believe, Imam and Omar said they had a meeting. Imam with a few of his companions, his son, and Omar saw with his son as well. They met each other in the between, in the middle of the two armies. Imam told Omar said it was a private message, a private meeting. Imam told him, Omar said. Why are you fighting with this? Why do you want to fight? Don't do that. Anyhow, so you know, because of dunya, I'm afraid they will destroy my family. Imam says, I will protect your family or something. He said, they're going to take my money, my houses and everything. Imam says, I will give you better than what you have in Kufa. Better houses than that you have in Kufa. Nope. He's not listening. He doesn't understand. Why? Because dunya comes and make that person blind. This is one of the things that we see that happen in the society. And like I said, coming to our society, we have to see that if any of these issues, if any of these characteristics we might have in our societies that we have to remove these characteristics. The first thing that we do when you go to the doctor, the first thing they do is what? To diagnose the issue, right? The first thing is that go have the blood work, come back to see what's going on. So the first thing that we have to see in the society, in the Ummah, we have to diagnose the factors and the issues. We have to analyze what happened so we can find the treatment for that. And Muharram is the best time to focus on that. Even personally, we have to focus on this. And to see that in my personal life, 
I am supposed to be, I'm supposed to improve myself. I'm supposed to change myself. My akhlaq, my temper, my spirituality, my salat, my ibadah. It's supposed to be changed. It's supposed to be better. What is that reason? What is that virus? You know, sometimes they take someone to the doctor and says, you know, God forbid, may Allah, inshallah, cure all the, inshallah, patient and sick people, inshallah. But sometimes you take them, you know, they take them to the doctor. The doctor tests everything, says, everything looks fine. But there is a reason that he is sick, she is sick. They can't find the reason. We go to Ramadan, mashallah, fasting and ibadah and everything is fine. After Ramadan, gradually you start losing that emotion and that passion that we built through Ramadan, right? We come to Muharram, we become so passionate, Alhamdulillah, with the name of Muhammad Hussain, and Allah, and learning, and being emotional, and we decide a lot of things. After Muharram, gradually, you see that it's fading. That means there's something going on. One of the ulama was saying very nice, he says, it's like you have a big bag, and you're putting a lot of treasures, beautiful jewelers and everything into the bag, but at the bottom of this bag, there's a hole. <laughs> Whatever you put, the salat, the ibadah, the mashallah, coming to the majalis and all the things. But there might be something. That means what? My temper. Breaking someone's heart. The way that I make money. My akhlaq, my sabr, patience, my tawakkul. My salat. Every one of those holds of it. The way that I talk. Anyhow, so this is this is so important, inshallah, to focus on. So that's what we have to analyze, to see what is going on, to learn, as I said, we do every day. We look back at the history of people, what made, made them successful, might make them failure. And be, based on that, we decide if we want to take that route or not. Now that, alhamdulillah, we are in the path of zuhur, we are in the path of, inshallah, mahdawiyya, we are in the path of improving ourselves. We are in a world that things are changing so fast. We have to understand what happened in the past. What happened? What made them successful? What made them failure? What helped on the other side as well? What helped the companion of Imam Hussein that they could stand in front of Imam Hussein and sacrifice their life for Imam Hussein as well? It's not just bad people of Kufa. No, look at the good people of Kufa as well. Good people, the soldiers of Imam Hussein. What made them at the night of Ashura, Imam, you know, that turn off the light and says, guys, you know what? They want to fight with me. Why do you want to? I take my oath, my allegiance. You can go. And that's night. Take the hands of my family and leave and go. What happened that they stay, stay there, stand up, and says, Ya Hussein, where we're we supposed to go? Ya Hussein, if we have multiple, multiple thousand lives, and we come back again, we still want to sacrifice ourselves to you and for you. If they burn us, we'll come back again to life. We want to still be sacrificed for you, Ya Hussein. What made them so brave? What made them to be successful in this path? Ya Hussein, help us in this path. Wherever you're sitting, close your eyes. See yourself in the haram of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wassalam and say, Ya Hussein, we know about these things. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna talk on behalf of myself. Ya Hussein, I did whatever I could. I will do whatever I can. But I need you, Ya Hussein, to take a look at me and my life and change it. I want to say something, Ya Hussein. This group of brothers and sisters, the Muhabbin and those who love you and your family, the only reason they're sitting here tonight, Ya Hussein, is your love. As soon as they hear your name, they cry for you, Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein, come to the majesty. Even our little children, they have black clothing because of your Muharram, Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein, everything already started. The whole passion here, Ya Hussein, because of you. Come to our majlis and our majalis, Ya Hussein, and bless our majlis. You help us, Ya Hussein, yourself to change. You help us to learn and to get what we're supposed to get from your majlis, Ya Hussein. It's a miracle, you know, when you look at your life, you look at your heart right now, 
But you hear the name of Hussein by the name of Hussein, you're sitting here. That name united you to be here tonight. All together, every night, inshallah, coming here for the Azar of Hussein and his family. Even if you, you know, you had a father passed away, and a mother, after a few days or months, you forget about that Azar, it's not that passionate anymore. What is in the name of Hussein that after all these years, almost 1400 years, as soon as you hear the name of Hussein, you start calling for Hussein. <laughs> Close your eyes and let's go to Karamala. Allahumma <laughs> Zalala. <laughs> On one side is the Haram of Abu al-Fadr al-Baz. You know what's going on in the first night of Muharram in Karbala right now. Good for those people who are there now. And see yourself in front of the Haram and say, Assalamu ala al-Husayn. Ah, oh, Ya Husayn, Ya Husayn. They said usually the first night of Muharram is after the name of the first Shaheed of the path of Hussein, of the ambassador of Hussein, the Muslim Ibn Aqeeq. Like Hussein himself, he was not even. Like Hussein himself, when he went to Kufa, 18,000 people gave oath of allegiance on behalf of Imam Hussein to Muslim. And at night, at the Salat of Maghrib, when he looked back, only few people stayed, and also them they left. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, Muslim wrote a letter to Hussein when they, you know, they gave the allegiance. And Hussein come to Kufa. 18,000 people, they gave the oath of allegiance to me. Hussein come to Kufa. But at night, Muslim in the alleys of Kufa, there is not even one man can help a Muslim. Muslim is a stranger in that city. He doesn't have anyone there. Not even one house to help Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> Until one lady opens the door. <laughs> so, uh, what are you doing here, brother? You have to go home, it's late. Oh, lady, oh, I don't have anyone in this city. Where are you? Are you a traveler? I am Muslim Ibn Amin, the ambassador of Muslim. He is wandering in the streets and alleys of Kufa and no one knows him. You know what happened? Let me go fast forward, go further. In front of Omar, in front of Ibn Ziyad. He wanted, they said, what do you want? He said, give me a glass of, you know, a bowl of water. My last wish gave him water. As soon as he wanted to drink water, the blood of his mouth dripped into the bowl. He said, there is a sign and should become Shaheed thirsty. Yes, Muslim, because they killed your master Hussein like that as well. <laughs> They took him on top of the Arun Imara, the palace. They wanted to throw him out of the Arun Imara. <laughs> Give me one second, what do you want? He probably looked towards, you know, towards the Karawan of Hussein when he came from Mecca. He looked at them and said, Assalamu alaikum ya Abdullah. Hussein, one regret Muslim has what? I wish I wouldn't send that letter to you, Ya Hussein. I wish I wouldn't tell you to go to Kufa.
I don't know, I want to say this on behalf of Muslim. Hussein, if you want to come to Kufa, come but don't bring Zainab with you. <laughs> Hussein, if you want to come to Kufa, to Karbala, come but don't bring Rokhaya and Zainab with you. God knows how much Muslim is, you know. He is feeling what happened and Hussein is coming towards the city that none of them keep their promises so not loyal to the Imam. He wish he could have one more life to send a letter to Hussein to stop him from coming. But it's late, Muslim Hussein is already on his way. Assalamu alaikum ya Abdullah. Whatever you're sitting, as I said, close your eyes. It's the first of Muharram, mashallah. Believe me, there is something about you that you are invited in this majlis, inshallah. There is a reason that you are in this majlis, inshallah. Close your eyes and they say this salam. Assalamu alaikum ya وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بغيت وبغي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله Whatever you're sitting, raise your voice, inshallah, you would reach Karbala. Assalamu alaikum. Mashallah, now inshallah is the first night of Muharram. Assalamu alaikum. If the brothers want to recite, please come forward. Only a few du'as, inshallah, please move forward. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, hasten in the duhur of our Imam, Imam Mahdi. Ya Allah, give us tawfiq to be among the true followers of our Imam. Ya Allah, give these brothers and sisters the best of khayr that you give to the best of all people of your servant in Muharram. Ya Allah, help our youth, make them successful in dunya wal akhirah. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, those who are still cured in this moment and those who are who passed away and the thawab and reward out of this message to their soul, inshaAllah. All together get ready, inshaAllah. Ya Hussain, oh Ya Hussain, Ya Hussain, oh Ya Hussain, Ya Hussain, oh Ya Hussain, Ya Hussain, oh Ya Hussain.